Hey, wait, North Mr. Yergler here. In this video, we're going to talk about ionization energy and atomic radius. Let's start with some definitions. The atomic radius is kind of as the name suggests, the size of the atom, the, the distance from the inside of the atom to the outside rings. And we're just going to assume that we're always in the ground state for this. We don't need to worry about the radius changing when we excite electrons out to outside orbitals. The trend that we see in the atomic radius is that when we go across the periodic table, across a period or a row, the radius of the atoms decreases. And this is simply because we're adding more protons to the center of the nucleus. So we're increasing the nuclear charge, pulling on those negative electrons a little bit stronger for every proton that we add. As we go down a group on the periodic table, the radius of the atoms increases. And this is due primarily because we're adding energy levels, which makes sense. If you think of, of the atom like an onion with multiple layers of electrons, for every layer that we add, it's going to increase the size of the atom. This is a great picture to kind of illustrate this. So notice that, that as we go across, it's, the change in radius is actually kind of subtle. Uh, it's not a real drastic change as we go across because the only thing that's changing is we're adding one more proton and that ever so slightly pulls those electrons in a little bit. But look how dramatic the change is as we go down a group. For, for every energy level that we add electrons into, we're dramatically increasing the size of the atom. So if you compare cesium to lithium, it's quite a big difference. But if you compare cesium and we add all these protons all the way across, only then are we starting to kind of get close to the size of, of sodium. All right, so let's predict the trend uh, given a few examples. So beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and strontium, you're always going to be given examples that are either in the same row or the same column. Uh, there's not a lot of benefit in, in trying to compare boron to tellurium, for example. As we go from beryllium to magnesium to calcium to strontium, we're adding an energy level every time, and so the, the radius is going to increase. Don't focus on memorizing that trend, that it increases as we go down. It's actually easier just to learn and learn it from, this, from the understanding of what's happening to the atom and how that affects the radius. What about when we go from nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine to neon? This one's a little bit less obvious. And again, don't memorize that it decreases as we go across. Just understand that, understand how the atom is changing as we as we go from from one element to the other, and from there you can deduce what's going to happen. As we add protons, that's going to pull in on the, on those outside electrons more, decreasing the size of the of the atom. All right, let's also look at ions: um, beryllium ion, magnesium ion, calcium, and strontium. All of these have lost their two valence electrons, all from the s sublevel. So essentially what they have is the electron configurations of the, pre, of the previous noble gas. So beryllium essentially has the, the electron configuration of helium. Magnesium essentially is neon. Uh, calcium has the electrons of argon and so on. So what we're really doing is still the same principle. We're still increasing the energy levels. Um, just because we've lost a couple of electrons, that changes the actual atomic radius. But the trend is still going to be the same as we're increasing energy levels, we're going to increase the size of the atom. Generally speaking, when atoms gain electrons, their size should fill in the blank, increase, decrease, or stay the same. They should increase. What about when they lose electrons? The size should decrease. This is obviously going to be true if we're changing the energy levels. For example, if you have like a sodium atom that it loses its one valence electron, now you no longer are filling that outside shell. And so obviously that's going to decrease the size if we're losing that electron. But this is also true if we're, if we're keeping the energy levels consistent. So this is an example of fluorine. When we fill that, it's actually going to increase the size of the atom slightly, even though we're not changing the energy levels. By adding one electron, we've increased the electron-electron repulsion that's going on from one level to another and even inside the second energy level. And if you want to kind of think of it as like the pull of the nucleus is kind of spread out across more electrons, you could think of it that way too. That's probably not exactly what's happening. It's probably more the electron-electron repulsion from the inner, inner electrons to now we have more electrons on the outside level. But either way you understand it, it's still increasing in size. When we lose an electron, like let's say we go backwards from, from the ion to the neutral atom of fluorine, the same principle applies but in the opposite direction. Now we have less electron, electron repulsion, and so then the size of the atom should decrease slightly. All right, let's talk also about ionization energy. This is the energy required to remove an electron from the valence shell of an atom or ion in the ground state. 
This graph is the first ionization energy. So I want to emphasize that. This is the ionization energy of just removing the first electron, not all of them. You're used to seeing photoelectron spectroscopy where we're removing all of the electrons. This is the energy required just to remove that first one. And the trend is related to the atomic radius. So think of it this way. As we go across the periodic table, the atom is getting smaller and smaller because that, that nuclear charge on the inside is getting stronger and stronger, right? Pulling those electrons in. Now the ionization energy is the energy required to remove those electrons. So it's kind of the opposite. As we pull those in stronger and stronger and tighter and tighter, the energy required should be getting larger in order to remove them, which makes sense. So again, all these trends are interrelated to each other and they're logical, they're very common sense. You just have to think, slow down and think about what's happening to the atom and all the attractions and repulsions that are going on as we add electrons or protons. So if we look at a specific period, I like this graph because it breaks it up into the different periods. As you go from sodium to argon, the overall trend is that we're increasing, which is consistent with what we just described. As we go down a group, this is harder to see on this graph. Look at helium, neon, argon, and krypton. This is down one group on the periodic table. The ionization energy is going to decrease because our radius is increasing. It gets easier and easier to remove that outside electron. All right, let's look at the example of aluminum. Aluminum's first ionization energy is 580 kilojoules per mole. If we look at our, our picture of our atom or our electron configuration, which electron are we going to be removing? the p1 electron the second ionization energy is 1800 so it, requ it always requires more energy to remove the second electron than the first because as we remove that electron the size of the atom has decreased a little bit so then the third electron requires even a little bit more and then look at the fourth the fourth ionization energy so this would be the energy to remove the fourth electron notice the huge jump in energy What's causing that huge increase in energy? As we remove the fourth electron, we're now removing it from the second energy level. It's going to require a lot more energy to remove an electron from a filled energy level, one that has a complete octet. Take a look at your periodic table. Why is sodium uh, higher in ionization energy than potassium? It's helpful to look at the picture of the, two, of the two atoms. Sodium has three energy levels, potassium has four. And so there's more shielding going on. And, and if you want to understand shielding, this picture, I think, explains it all. These outside electrons are attracted to the nucleus, just like any electron is. But the more inner electrons you, you have, the more layers of electrons, so to speak, the more electron-electron repulsion you have, which makes it easier to remove those outside electrons, therefore requiring less energy. What about oxygen versus fluorine? Why is oxygen lower in, in ionization energy than fluorine? Again, look at the pictures. They have the same number of energy levels. The only difference is the number of protons and the number of electrons. Fluorine is going to have a larger uh, nuclear charge, and so it's going to be holding on to its electrons a little bit stronger. Its radius is a little bit smaller, which makes sense as well. So it's going to be harder to remove an electron from fluorine than oxygen. There are a few anomalies in the ionization energy chart. If we look carefully, the overall trend as we go from lithium to neon is upwards. But there's occasionally these little tiny dips. We should be able to explain why it dips in ionization energy from beryllium to boron. Kind of similar to how aluminum's fourth ionization energy has a huge increase in, in size. Boron, we've now added an electron in, in the p orbital, and so it's going to be easier to remove that partially filled p sublevel than removing electrons from a full s orbital. Similarly, there's another dip from nitrogen to oxygen. Think about the electron configuration of those two elements. And you should be able to explain why oxygen is slightly easier to ionize than nitrogen. On the surface, these look like anomalies, but in actuality, they're following the same rules that, that we've always been following. Electrons repel each other, and they're attracted to the nucleus. Every atom is slightly different in its arrangement and its, in its structure, but it's still going to follow the, the rules of physics regardless. If you have any questions on this, be sure to write those down right now and bring them up in class, and we can get some practice with ionization energy and atomic radius. All right, this is Mr. Yergler, signing off.